Okay, Chairman, uh, we're now live and you can start the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, David. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to you all and welcome to the Growth, Environment and Resources Scrutiny Committee. I'd like to start by welcoming those members of the public and press who are watching the live stream of this meeting through the Council's YouTube page. Due to government guidance on social distancing, this meeting is taking place remotely in accordance with the current legislation, which makes provision for remote attendance at and remote access to council meetings. The meeting is also following Peterborough City Council's virtual meeting protocol. In order for this meeting to run smoothly, I ask several things from members and participants. Firstly, that you keep your video camera switched on, with your microphone muted except when I invite you to speak. If you wish to speak, please raise the virtual hand, which is the blue hand and is located at the bottom of the participants section. Some of you may have a newer version of Zoom now, which, and in which case the raised hand function has moved from the participants section to the reactions section and is now yellow. Whichever version you're using, please ensure you use your raised hand function to indicate that you wish to speak. I and the Democratic Services team will keep an eye on the participants list to see who wishes to speak. Please be patient if you're not invited to speak straight away. As you raise hand and you have your hand raised, there may be other people wishing to speak before you. The Democratic Services team will be monitoring the participants list to see if anyone has dropped out of the meeting and will try and contact you to provide assistance to rejoin should this happen. As with all new systems, we may run into technical problems and for this I ask for your patience. Should this occur, an adjournment of the meeting will be declared while the fault is addressed and the public broadcast will be paused. If it's not possible, the meeting will then be adjourned until such times it can be reconvened. Finally, I remind members that all virtual meetings are recorded. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'll begin by taking a roll call of all scrutiny members to establish your presence. When your name is called out, please unmute your microphone and confirm that you're in attendance. Thank you. Councillor Aitken. Present. Councillor Brown. Present. Councillor Burbage. Present, thank you. Councillor Casey. Present. Councillor Ellis. Present. Councillor Judy Fox. Present. Councillor Howard. Good evening, present. Councillor Skipstead. Present. Councillor Wiggin. Present. Councillors in. Present, thank you, Chair. And Parish Councillor Leavesley. Present, Chair. Thank you. Also in attendance is Steve Cox, the Executive Director, Place and Economy, who will support the committee as lead officer. David Bucham as supporting Democratic officer and other members of the Democratic Services team will also support the meeting in the background in case we have any difficulties. Thank you. I'll now move on to agenda item one, which is apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chairman. No apologies this evening. Thank you. Item two then is declarations of interest and whipping declarations. No, nope, don't see any hands up. Item three then, we now move to agenda item three, minutes of the Growth, Environment and Resources Scrutiny Committee meeting held on the 10th of November 2020, which are pages three to 10 of your agenda. We have been asked to approve the minutes as set out on the agenda as a correct record. Can I ask if any member who does not agree with that, these minutes are a true record to please raise your hand now. Uh, I see no objections, so we'll take that that the minutes are agreed. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item four, which is calling of any cabinet, cabinet member or key officer decision, David. Uh, no call in, Cecilia. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Then we'll move to agenda item five, which is the portfolio progress report, cabinet member for strategic planning and commercial strategy and investments, pages 11 to 74 in your packs. I'd like to welcome Councillor Peter Hiller, and the following officers are in attendance to assist with the presentation of this report. Charlotte Palmer, Group Manager, Transport and Environment. Nick Hardin, Head of Planning. Howard Bright, Principal Development Manager, Peterborough Investment Partnership. And Keith McWilliams, Contract Manager at Skanska. Um, Councillor Hiller, are you going to introduce the report? Um, yes, Chair, and, and good evening to you and good evening to the Scrutiny Committee members. 
Um, thank, thanks for inviting us here this evening. Um, uh, we've got together, I think, with this portfolio on a number of times over the years. Um, the, the portfolio has changed marginally over those years. But it's been interesting to talk to members at these scrutiny panels and, and of course, answer any questions and, and queries that you might have about the portfolio ongoing. The report overview um, for the committee's remit, I think, is both concise and clear, Chair, and I hope the committee members have had the opportunity to read it. Um, as you've alluded to, uh, we have a, a, a number of senior officers uh, involved in the various service areas here this evening to answer any detailed questions, but service areas are particular for this committee, I guess, of, of, of development and regen, highways and, and flood risk management. Um, for, for some years now, uh, Chair, members, we've been embarked upon an extensive programme of development and the regeneration of, of our city. And this continues pace, say, with our recent success with the Towns Fund bid, helping to continue uh, this uh, ambition that we have. Um, most recently, we've been successful with the university project actually becoming a reality. Blackton Keys is nearing completion of the residential element and the commencement of the government hub office and hotel. Um, we have ambitious proposals with the new leisure complex on the Peterborough Investment Partnership owned Pleasure Fair site. Peterborough Investment Partnership has also just signed an option agreement with the council to take forward the Northminster regeneration. As members, I'm sure will be aware of, it's, it's just sat there for, for many, many years and, and pretty pictures on people's office walls. Um, North Westgate uh, similarly is finally coming to fruition with asset ownership for the site with our partner Hawksworth. Uh, and the station quarter is uh, similarly progressing with Network Rail, the Combined Authority and LNER. Um, happy for the officers that we have here to answer any detailed questions you might have pertaining to the relevant service areas of our council's functions. But just a, a point, I, members I hope will be aware of the successful highway service we have with partners, Skanska, often unsung rows. These guys are out all weathers, all times of the year um, in some pretty arduous conditions, especially during the COVID lockdown. Um, our winter service has been year after year after year has been successful and, and well stocked with salt. Uh, these things are, are often unspoken about and unheralded, but it's this machine of Peterborough Highway Services, PHS, as we all know, that, that keep these things ongoing. It was created some seven years ago, and we now lead the country in terms of customer satisfaction. Um, no mean feat in today's somewhat austere financial climate, I hope you'll be aware. Um, as is Chair has already mentioned, Charlotte Palmer, the Head of Highway Service, is here this evening to answer any detailed questions you have, as is Keith McWilliam, our Skanska lead. Um, th thank you, Chair. I, I hope that was a, a reasonable introduction for you. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Um, so as those members who didn't come to or couldn't uh, be at the pre-meeting, um, when it comes to questions, what we're going to do is going to go page by page, because there's quite a bit of detail in there. Uh, and we have quite several questions, certainly for officers, so um, when we get to the right section, if you could put your hand up and then I'll bring you in one at a time and we'll see how we go with it. So we're going to start with page 12. And page 13. Count it as in. If you could also give us the um, reference number on the page, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is from page 13 and it's point four, point two, um, right at the bottom where it says upcoming challenges. Um, it mentions the planning white paper and environment bill um, and the fact that it could have significant effects um, on the service area. Um, we do um, have some idea, but it's quite vague. Um, so my question was, um, are there any specific um, effects that have been highlighted or identified um, that we could get some more info on today, please. Okay. Um, Councillor, did you want to assign that to somebody as you're the... Uh, yes, I, I guess Nick Harding, as, as the planning head, would give a, a, a detailed answer on that. But uh, if I might, Chair, um, 
yeah, we, we, we are concerned about the planning, the, the two planning papers actually, which are, which are currently going through government. They're out to, well, they've been out to consultation. The consultation has finished now. Um, one of the biggest fears I had, um, uh, Councillor Yazin, was, was the uh, potential increase in the level of power that we were going to be forced to provide based on an algorithm uh, calculation um, that, that government had proposed. This now has been backtracked by government. And in fact, what we're looking at now potentially um, is, is a marginal decrease in the amount of houses that we are being asked to provide on an annual basis. And that's to, to suggest that we don't want those houses. Is it just that we don't want to be forced into a situation where the targets are unachievable and as such, our poten uh, potentially our five-year supply of, of housing could be affected and allow um, you know, a, a back door to open for predatory applications, which we've seen in the past. So um, that was my main concern. Um, we, we also had, um, Nick will probably allude, a potential increase in the threshold for affordable housing provision on sites up to think it was 50 houses or from 50. Um, Nick, Nick will um, uh, detail that. Um, but yeah, there are a number of areas that we that I'm quite happy, Councillor Day, ask a question at full council. Um, can, can we keep members posted? Happy to do that, but it is very much in the the formative stages at, at this time. Nick, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Hiller. Uh, to add to the points that you've raised, the key thing about the housing, white, the planning white paper, should I say, is that it turns um, the preparation of a, a local plan on its head. It's a very different process that the government is envisaging. And the idea is that the local plan would essentially front load the whole of the development process compared to now. So uh, any site which is allocated in the new local plan would effectively equal the grant of planning permission for the development of that site. And the expectation is that um, in the preparation of our local plan, we would be setting out the way in which those individual sites allocated in the local plan will be developed out. So it's a very much more detailed approach, uh, which will need a very different set of skills or additional skills, should I say, within the planning policy team. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I've got co-op parish councillor, Keith Leasley, please. Thank you, Chair. I think Peter and Nick may have partly answered one of my first questions because some months ago, after the uh, publication of the white paper, Nick came to the Parish Council's forum to Barnack Ward and said that um, the City Council had crunched the algorithm and the housing requirement had gone up from about 900 to 1300 in round figures. And I said to Nick that um, as one of the people involved in the rebuttal of um, of great kind, which Peter Hiller was one of our supporters, we were concerned that, um, bearing in mind our, our worries of its impact on Castle Hanglands, that great kind would come back into play. I think Nick felt at the time of the first algorithm that might very well be the case. So do, can I infer from what Peter and Nick have said that that is, that is likely to be diminishing or is it still a threat? Um, and my, my second question related to what Nick's just touched on in terms of change to local plan, do you see this, Nick, as a sort of more of substance or format or, or both? Because the white paper had these very odd comments about um, they thought it was too difficult for modern people to read. So it got to be pictures on a phone where you could sort of comment in five minutes. I mean, what um, are you saying that apart from the, the front loading, that there are likely to be any other changes in the local plan format? Nick, would you like to answer that? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, as uh, you, you've mentioned, um, the idea of government is that the local plan process would be much more easily accessible to more people than has hitherto been the case. Um, what they see is uh, the new local plans being primarily an electronic based um, system um, 
that people can get to grips with and understand um, far more easily than um, has been the case traditionally. When it comes to where land might be allocated in the future local plan, um, that's not something I'm in a position to speculate on. Um, we will have um, housing sites to find. There will be, I'm sure, even in the new system, a call for sites process, and those sites um, would have to go through an evaluation process, <clears throat> a technical process, and naturally there would be the consultation process and the political processes to go through. And I'm sure there will remain um, independent examination. So, you know, with all of those caveats in place, I hope you understand, I, I can't say that um, the, the crime site won't come forward and I can't say it will come forward because um, that's all in the future and I'm not in direct control of that future. Okay, thanks, Nick. Okay, thank you. If, um, if I might just... Do you want to come in? If possible. Yeah. Possible. Um, okay, yes, I mean, Nick touched on the public consultation and, and that's something we certainly welcome in the creation of our local plans um, as well as the potential but what the government is suggesting, I mean, it's, it's an interesting and, and quite sobering statistic that when, when local plans go out to public consultation, less than 1% of the affected public actually comment. I mean, that's, that's really, really quite sobering stuff, isn't it? And, and yet, um, when applications are judged and against policy laid out in the respective local plans, of course, sometimes it can be very controversial. Um, so, uh, you know, it encourages a, a local um, input into the creation of any future planning policy <coughs> and policy, I think, is, has got to be welcomed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Steve. You wanted to come in? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. It's just to amplify, really, what's been said about uh, and the question about whether uh, it's a simpler approach. And I think in some respects uh, it is by... The, the proposal to, to seek to designate areas, as, as Nick has said, as, as growth zones where uh, planning approval is, uh, is essentially granted. Uh, and also then I think renewal zones uh, and protected zones. So it, it, it in some ways does simplify uh, the, the approach, which may encourage people to get more interested in perhaps than they have done in the past in getting involved in helping to shape the local plans. But, but I, I do also think the sus suspect that the uh, the significance if it's got a cross of a local plan actually itself granting essentially granting a planning approval will get the attention I'm sure of more people who will want to contribute their thoughts at that stage and I think it's also uh, important to note that uh, a local plan which starts to set out those zones uh, will mean that uh, we as local local authorities will need to be clearer in our own minds uh, about what it is that we see the future of our places looking like and that I think probably is a is not a bad thing Good, thank you very much. Councillor Lisa, do you have another question or is can I move on? Uh, just in response to Steve, I think one of the, the observations we had uh, from a real perspective was when the uh, white paper was issued, it was, it was not very, not entirely clear uh, when and when we could make comments on, on sort of planning developments. Steve's outlined the sort of basic three tier structure. So I think it'd be interesting to wait and see what comes out if, if, if they're going to change it. But um, it was certainly not very clear where we were going to fit in in the future. OK, thank you very much. OK, we're going to move on now to page 14. So we moved into highways section. Any questions? Councillor Wigan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question about on the highways um, portfolio but about something that isn't in the report that I would have uh, I w would have wanted to see and ask about it's uh, to do with uh, road adoption um, so uh, how many um, how much highway has been taken on by the um, local authority during the um, during the period of the report and since um, and what progress has been made um, over the last year, um, understanding, of course, the likely delays caused by uh, working arrangements through COVID. Okay. Charlotte, is that something you can answer? 
or would you need to send us a brief? Um, probably a bit of both, um, Chair, to be honest. Um, so I don't have figures to hand for the number of roads that have been adopted or or various different elements of highway infrastructure, but that's certainly something that I can collate and bring back to the group. Um, there have been obviously some impacts from the COVID pandemic, um, as Councillor Wiggin touched on, um, but on the whole, the development is continuing across the city and we continue, the team continues to work, albeit on a primarily remote basis um, and visiting sites as and when. So there's not been significant delay to any adoptions from a COVID perspective. Um, business is continuing um, pretty much, much as usual, as much as possible. Um, but in terms of the actual numbers of sites, yeah, that'd be something that I'd need to come back to you on. Okay, fine. Uh, I think Councillor Head, have you got something to add on this one? Um, yes, just, just leading on from Charlotte's comments. Um, I, I think, um, Councillor Wigging, you, you, you have to be aware that to, to a great degree, um, highways adoption is a reactive process via the DHS in, in, in that unless the roads are finished to an acceptable standard by the developer, um, Peterborough City Council will not adopt that highway for, for obvious reasons. Um, once the highway is adopted and the, uh, the, the testing period um, is, is over, that, that then becomes the liability of, of Peterborough City Council why would we want to adopt the highway if it's substandard? Um, so, as I say, to, to a degree, it's a reactive process rather than a proactive process. I, I hope it's clear. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Aitken. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Hiller, I'm just following on from Councillor Wiggins' uh, question with regards to adoptions. I'm fully aware that obviously it's uh, developers really that have to bring the road to a certain standard before the council can actually um, adopt any of the roads. Um, I, I have an, a number in my area that, that need to be adopted. What I have recognised, however, is we have lost a valuable member of the, the council team. Um, and I'm, I'm unsure as to whether um, councillors are, are actually aware that, that we have lost a valuable member and therefore subsequently a lot of the work has been passed to other members of the team and that that team are beginning to, to after having to catch up with what what's happening so um, I'm just wondering whether that has really had a, an impact on on the team as a whole Can't say you should put your hand up, or are we going to Charlotte for that? Um, well, I, I put my hand down and then put it back up, Chair, um, yeah. in response to Councillor Aiken. Um, we, you know, we have a very capable head of highways in Charlotte Farm, and I'm sure if there are any shortfalls in service delivery, Charlotte, uh, we'll tackle those head on. Um, I'm not 100% sure that we do have that many issues in that particular area of our highway service, but um, I'm more than happy to. Uh, Charlotte, explain what, what, what um, whatever she wants to explain. Charlotte? Yes, yeah, of course. So if I just add in from there, of course, if you've got any particular concerns or issues, do just let me know about those and I can look into them and come back to you at any point in time. Um, but in relation to the, um, the structure of the team, um, we have recently been through a restructure process um, since the departure of Andy Tatt and Julie Smith. That has now been completed. Um, and as you know, I'm in the, uh, in the position um, that we've already discussed briefly tonight. Um, but also Nick Greaves has been appointed to the role um, of... Um, the development control, um, sorry, I can't get my words out, the highway development and drainage control manager. Um, so he's covering that, that area. So if you've got any concerns as well, Nick will be picking all of those up. Um, the, the, of what we will now be going into a process of is, is the, the team that supports Nick effectively because Nick has been promoted. So that leaves a vacancy um, in the post that he's moved up from. So we'll be going through the process of looking at that role um, and seeing what skills and resources you know, we need to bring in to fill that vacancy effectively. Uh, but we're going through that process at the moment, but I'm not aware that that's having a significant impact on, on output at the moment. But like I say, if you've got any concerns, just let me know. Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, Steve Cox. Yeah, just just again to to, to reiterate, really, yeah, we have gone through a significant change uh, with that, with Andy and Julie going, but I'm I'm delighted that Charlotte is is taking taking up the reins and leading the team um, uh, and doing it really well uh, for us. 
Uh, if it's helpful, if it's useful, we can provide just details of the key officers uh, within the team. So points of contact, uh, if that's helpful, we can we can arrange for that to be shared uh, with the committee. Well, I think that's a good idea. I think that's that's we have had some emails about that, but that would be a good thing to have. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Aitken, your hand still up. No, it's gone down. Well, I've got nothing over the hands for that particular page except mine. So I um, just wanted to ask Charlotte if you could, I know it's early days, but one of the um, actual performance targets shown in there was the um, category two defects. And, and it showed obviously in, your, in the main report, the Skanska report, how that had gone into the red uh, rag rating. I just wondered what, um, what things were gonna be put in place to uh, address that effect. It's not a bad result, but obviously it's still shown as a, um, a red ragged, um, you know, in, in the red rag, to, uh, in the rag rate, and as a red category. So, uh, what are you going to do to address that and try and drive it up? Yeah, you're right to identify that. That has, is an area that we've had some challenges with um, through this reporting period and since. We've undertaken um, quite a comprehensive review to ascertain the issues in that area and implemented um, some, some significant improvements that we've really started to realise through the summer. Um, however, we have started to feel the impact of that again with the, the issues that we have to deal with around sickness um, and, and, and other works at the moment. But um, Key could pro probably give you a little bit more detail on the process that we've gone through and the improvements we've actually implemented if you, if if you're happy with that yeah that's right yeah that's fine good evening everybody so um as charlotte says we undertook a, a fairly detailed review of of how that cat 2 process was working um i think it's it's worth noting that the the performance targets are are very high so it's not the performance is bad but we are falling short of those those are high targets over the past um we we implemented that review back back at the start of this financial year and since then, we've seen that KPI return to green, except in the last month. And the kind of actions that we that we we did was we obviously there was closer scrutiny of the of the gangs uh, and their performance. We introduced a new works management system. We looked at how the phasing of work between the inspectors and how that linked into into the into the gangs. There was quite a bit of of restructuring within the team. Some new faces has taken a bit of time for those to bed in. So we're certainly in a much, much better place than we were um, when the report over the reporting period. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ellis, have you got still one on 14, yeah? No, oh, no, yes. Page, page 14 goes into page 15 at, at the bottom. Yes. It's regarding the smart cities um, scheme, which is also in the, um, the report, the annual report from Skanska, where they were do, they've done a trial on the Aldo Road and the A1260, which has been successful. Um, and it's just really a question of what plans there are to roll this out elsewhere in the city, because it's basically it's um, the, the real-time intelligence sensors to pick up how people are traveling, um, what modes of transport and, and how often. I don't know if Charlotte can elaborate on what future plans there is for this, because I'm very you know keen on this for looking at how we travel in regard to the environment. Okay. Charlotte? Yeah, sure. So um, the, as you'll have seen from the report, the Smart um, Cities work has been really useful, um, especially lately. I mean, one of the things that the report doesn't go into detail on, um, but just to give you an idea really for how this type of intervention can be really useful, um, is th these two sensors that are, well, these two locations that have sensors in the city have been providing us with data throughout the COVID period to ascertain um, levels of transport on our network effectively, um, which is basically showing us at the moment that we're currently, and um, the most recent data shows us um, that at the moment the volume of traffic on the road is approximately 64% of the pre-pandemic levels and um, that's slightly different um, compared to the two locations where we have the sensor technology up. One is um, one is um, showing slightly different to the other as you'd anticipate for the type of network areas that they cover. Um, it's also the same technology that we've used um, as part of the active travel measures as well in order to record um, on cycling, um, and walk, cycling and traffic movement around all of those um, temporary pop-up cycle lanes that we've had and um, so to provide some good and useful data 
for us. Um, the, the, the way that we're approaching this work at the moment is really very much about us and make, creating a better understanding of the city's network um, and not, therefore looking for areas of the network that we can optimise the use of. So um, if, there, if we have areas where we have high levels of congestion, what activities can we undertake in those areas to ease that congestion? It may not necessarily um, be about creating new highway and building new infrastructure. Um, it might be about um, as, as some, you know, the kind of phrase like sweating the asset effectively to make sure we can get as much use out of the existing infrastructure as possible. Um, so where we're at at the moment with this is we've now got a, a programme where we have identified where sensors would be required across the city. Um, we're looking at funding opportunities in order to bring that forward. Um, but what we're also looking at is where we're undertaking schemes going forward and um, beginning to install this equipment more by default so that we can start to gather more and more intelligence uh, across the network um, over the next couple of years, really. Good. Thank you very much. That's very informative. OK, we're going to move on on to page 15 now. Um, and I'm going to go by section, if I could, just as we keep all questions in the same area. So first one would be Peter Investment Partnership. Anything on that? Count to Skipstead. Uh, yes, um, that in that section, they you talk they talk about the regional pool. And I, my question is really um, that given the situation we are now, we now find ourselves in, uh, is it appropriate to be spending 38 million on updating the pool, which is still functional? And is this, and could this project not be postponed to a time when finances are both more stable or in terms of you know, the future being unknown or, and healthier? Okay, Councillor, I see your hand's gone up. You're gonna answer that one. Um, yes, this, this is um, you know, quite a complex subject in all honesty, and I, and I think um, with, with respect to um, Councillor Skip, Skipsit's question, uh, yeah, there, there is a, a fair bit of disinformation about what it is exactly we are endeavouring to do with this. Um, Howard Bright, I'm sure, will, Tracy, um, will give you an overview of what it is we, we are endeavouring to do from Peterborough Investment ship's point of view and, and of course Steve is the lead director on on this um, central new facility so um, the numbers do stack up the sums do stack up I, I have to say um, and you know the cabinet decision has been made you'll be aware of um, of, of that I'm sure and and I believe the group um, is in the public domain but um, Howard and Steve I, th I think could, could give you far more detail. Thank you. How would you like to add on? Or Steve, of course, whoever. Steve, would you like me to just, uh, good evening, uh, councillors, would you like me to just kick off with a tracy of the pool for those who aren't necessarily up to speed on it, and then maybe, Steve, you could pick up some of the detail on some of the numbers? Indeed, yep. I'm happy with that. Howard, if you lead on it, and then I can help take any questions, if that's appropriate with members. Okay. Uh, so the... What has been proposed on Pledge of Fair Meadows car park is a new leisure facility. It's uh, a significant extension of the facility in terms of what's available uh, compared to the regional pool. So the regional pool, uh, councillors will be aware, is a six lane, 25 metre pool, uh, a modest gym, uh, a diving pool and some learning pool facilities. Uh, there are no <coughs> it, it's, it falls a little bit short of what people come to expect from a modern leisure facility. Um, which is fair enough because, of course, we have to remember that it was built in 1976-77 at a very different time when people had very different expectations. And I think we should remember how uh, the, the quality of the service that that facility has given to the city over its 40 years life. Uh, but it is at the end of its life period. Uh, the council has had a condition survey done uh, to continue to use it as a leisure centre will require significant investment over the next decade. And it has an uncertain future at that point. Uh, and the challenge facing the council with its current finances, I, I accept what others have suggested, is around whether it invests in a facility nearing the end of its life or creates a new uh, fit for purpose landmark facility for the next 40 years in, in the same way as the, uh, as the council at the time in 1976-77 took the bold decision to invest back then. Uh, <clears throat> and the facility on Pleasure Fair would be a bold decision it has been a bold decision for, for the council. Uh, it's a much wide, larger facility. It's an eight lane, 25 metre pool, provides steam and sauna facilities, 
there's leisure pool space. It's much more a family friendly facility with clip and climb cafe facilities, uh, sports hall facilities, places where people can obviously use a gym, much larger gym. It's, it's a much bigger, much um, more broadly appealing facility than has been uh, talked about for, for the regional pool as the existing site. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, Steve, uh, Councillor Allen, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I'm quite happy with that overview. Um, if there's any specific questions for me, I'm happy to take them. But I do think I would add that uh, it is the right time to do it. We have to drive these kind of leisure facilities forward. It's a pool fit for the 21st century, whereas as uh, we have heard from how the other one is now uh, kind of past its use by date. And I think that we must grab the metal and uh, take these new dynamic ideas forward for our population. You know, we can't just rest on our laurels. Thank you. Uh, Steve Cox, did you want to come in there? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, it's just to say the, uh, the information that was uh, behind the Cabinet decision uh, last year uh, contained some, some numbers which I think reflect the, the financial sense that this uh, proposal is going to, to bring. Um, the cost of retaining and, and maintaining the existing pool over, over a 10-year period will be significant revenue uh, draw, drain on the, on the council. Um, and that's a revenue cost that we could be putting towards the, the borrowing to uh, deliver a new facility uh, and everything that Councillor Allen has described in terms of the quality uh, and, and variety of, of, of uses it brings to, for the city centre and for all residents across the city. Um, and, and just a footnote, um, I'll be uh, emailing out to all councillors in the morning uh, about the pool working group that the cabinet has set up, which will be meeting again on the 19th of January. Uh, to, to invite any, any questions uh, that uh, any councillor has got, and also to invite mem members if they wish to, to uh, uh, come along and ask a question at that uh, meeting on the 19th. Um, but so some of the questions tonight I can certainly carry forward uh, to, to that uh, if, uh, if members wish, but that, uh, that email will be coming out to everybody in the morning. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Hill, I'll see you come back in. Um, yes, just, just a, a brief point, Chair, if I might, just adding to what Howard has, has very succinctly outlined um, Steve, uh, Councillor Allen, of course, and, and Steve Cox, um, is that let's not forget members that this is, is a very important site um, in an area that is sorely in need of regeneration. We have Pletton Keys opposite with some wonderful um, apartments overlooking the river. We have a hotel, we have a government hub offices, we have the council offices. Um, we, we have so much development going on there. It, this, this will also lock um, the further regeneration of an area that side of the bridge that is sorely in need of investment and refurbishment. It's as simple as that. Uh, and um, this is a very, very important site for that to, 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 to be kick-started. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor um, Skipson, did you have a second? You just, please wait. Well, I just wanted to come back and say I'm not in any uh, doubt about the importance of the project or disagree with its importance in any way, but it's the timing. I'm thinking at the moment, we, when this project was started, we weren't in the situation that we are now. And at the moment, we have no idea when things are going to change, when we're going to be able to, to even use a pool, let alone you know, anything else. It just seems to be the timing right now for planning such a big project. It, it, to me, it seems that it, it should be put on hold for now until we have a bit more security about what's going on. Councillor Heather. Yeah, if I might, Chair, um, I, I think Councillor Skipson makes a very valid point, but you, you mentioned several times it's, it's about the planning, and I think the planning needs to be done now. I don't think, in my own mind, there is no, no question of that, but the planning needs to be done now. And in... in reality um, when we first started to talk about this it was during last year and, and we had lockdown from March onwards so I don't think there's anything new from that point of view if we're planning now um, this won't happen realistically for, for you know probably 18 months two years three years maybe you know, we, we have to determine that but we can't just sit, sit on our hands now when we're planning for a, a, a wonderful um, concept like this um, at, at some time in the in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you very much. I think you've answered the question. Councillor Yezzy, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, my question has partly been covered by um, Councillor Skibstead, but um, again, I, I have concerns over the timing, um, more so from the pandemic um, side of things. I mean, in an ideal world, we would all like to resume back to normality in the next couple of weeks, but who knows when that, when that will happen. Um, and I completely appreciate that we are still at the planning stage of things and things won't actually move and get completed for another 18 months or potentially even to three years. But we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. We don't know how long we're going to be in lockdown. We don't know how long members of the public will not be able to access leisure, leisure facilities. In such a situation where there's so little certainty, is it a wise idea to be spending so much money? Councillor Well, the simple answer to that is is yes, we, we have to plan. And I think from uh, you know many conversations I've had with with my colleague Councillor Allen, we, we appreciate and understand that yes, we're under an enormously disruptive regime currently, but it doesn't stop this administration planning for the future. We have to plan. Uh, we, we have to have schemes on the table. Um, the actual expenditure, of course, will happen when it happens. It's not happening at the moment. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, it is the right time. I firmly believe that. Otherwise, we collectively wouldn't wouldn't be doing it. I can't say anything else, Joe. OK, Steve Cox, you got anything to add? Uh, just, just a couple of points um, uh, to, to, to say. I think during the difficult times we're in, both the COVID and the economic uh, uh, difficulties, um, planning and having the uh, ambition and drive to, to see through it is really important, take, taking full account of, of the comments that have been made. Uh, and I think when, when you look at the ambition for, with this scheme, but also the progress made since March on the university scheme, it, it's exactly, I think, the right thing to be doing for the future of the city is, is to show the confidence that we all share in the city uh, and to, to, to residents, but also to, to, to other investors. So I, I can understand the question, but I, I do think it's the right time to be, to be getting on with, with big ambitious schemes uh, for the city. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Steve Allen. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Steve Cox. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hiller. Uh, I think that uh, what we need to do is consider this as an investment, not just spending money. You would expect an administration to invest in the future of our city and that is just what we're doing. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Hinton, you've got your hand up. Was there another question or was it? No. Councillor Casey then. Thank you very much Chair. Um, I was just reading through it was interesting to see that uh, the pool was going to be above ground again because it, it appears that the plans are to have the car park underneath the pool and I, I remember uh, with the regional pool one of the problems was uh, that the ground that the pool was above ground and that used to have what well, used to introduce all sorts of different sort of complexities in the running of it um, I'm just wondering if that's been considered as part of the consultation and with the consultation I was hoping that the swimming club uh, would be involved in the ambition for the usage of the pool because I know the regional pool has been really good as a regional centre for holding uh, regional galas, uh, county galas and things like that. So the specification of the length of the pool, I, I think there was something about the current pool that uh, when they put the timing pads in, it meant that it was a little bit short for having a certain classification of gala. So all of these things need to be taken into account and with in consultation with Sport England as well. Um, but also a viewing area for, for parents uh, who spend quite a long time at these regional galas and galas all through the year. Uh, I hope that's all going to be part of the, of the, of the piece. Howard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just sorry, want to I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, apologies. apologies. It wasn't Councillor Howard, it was, it's Howard Wright who put his hand I'm up. I'm sorry. Can I just let Howard come in first and I'll come to you, Councillor Howard. Uh, OK, um, I'll try to just cover off some of the points that Councillor Casey picked up there. Um, <clears throat> the first one uh, you, you raised was to do with the fact that the pool will be raised uh, outside of the ground, much the same as the, uh, the pool is on, on the regional pool. Uh, I should caveat this by saying I'm not a structural engineer. 
Uh, and it definitely surprised me when I first heard about it. But I, <clears throat> but actually, one of the things that um, pools are often done these days is they're very often put above ground in this way. And that's because actually the structure sits on top of piles. So even if they're in the ground, the structure supporting it is a piled foundation. Uh, and that's what they actually sit on, not the actual ground itself. And then, therefore, you can have these piles above ground. You have the piles in the ground and then they're supported, whether it's a ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor. If you think about the hotels uh, across the world that have pools at very high height, it's all about conveying, conveying that weight all the way down through the foundations down into the piles in the ground. So uh, although it can sound a little counterintuitive, it's perfectly normal these days to have pools suspended above, uh, above ground. Um, to pick up your point, yes, there will be spectator areas for, of course, people to look at the competition standard 25 metre pool. And because it will be competition standard and the Sports England specifications, it will be able to host all of the competitions that are appropriate for a regional level uh, 25 metre uh, facility. OK, good. Thank you very much. Now, Councillor Howard, please. Thank you. It's safe to come out. It's safe to come out. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my question was probably just to reassure members slightly further on, on the discussions about the new pool. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of the timescale, because I know we're talking about this now, the whole planning, building, construction. I presume we're talking, even if a decision was made tomorrow, we're still talking many years ahead. And, and also the budgetary element of where the money comes from, how it doesn't directly impact day-to-day -day funded. I just thought it might reassure members if we could know a bit more about the time scale and the funding to perhaps reassure them. Thank Steve you. Cox, can I ask you for that one? Yes, uh, thanks, Chair. The, um, I think the timescales uh, were set out a little earlier in, in terms of the, the planning that needs to happen and the delivery over the next two to three years. Uh, the costs, the capital costs are ones that, that, that obviously are going to be cap capital funded, but there is a revenue cost to that. But the, you'll see from the papers that uh, Cabinet uh, saw, uh, the actual revenue costs of, of borrowing to, to meet the, uh, the, uh, the need uh, to, to raise the capital for the new scheme are less than the costs of maintaining uh, the existing facility. Uh, um, that's a very broad brush uh, sort of uh, summary of the, of the numbers, but that's more detailed in the Cabinet papers. But, but I think, going back to the first questions, I think, does this make uh, financial sense, aside from having a, a new facility in the city, uh, then, it, then it does. Thank you very much. OK, we were going to move on then um, to Psalm 15, Meacham Homes. Anything on that? Councillor Howard, your hand still up. Do you want something on that one? No. OK, page 16 then, and we'll go with um, Regeneration and Growth, New University. The Embankment Master Plan. There should be some on the next one, Car Parking Strategy. I know um, Councillor Casey, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, really, I was I was reading through, I was interested to see that we're at 57% uh, capacity at the moment. And I was just wondering how how that compares with the loss of car parking um, with the plan. I don't know whether or not it's, well, I think it's like for like for the swimming pool, but also the other sites that we're losing for, to car parking. Uh, I know um, lots of cities seem to be cutting down on their capacity for car parking, and I'm just wondering whether or not with the growth ambitions for the city, uh, if we're looking to still increase to a population of 250,000, whether or not keeping cutting it by 57 is robust, uh, can be um, defended robustly. And, and when, when also, when Royal Hasconing uh, carried out their survey, what time of year was it? And... Uh, how does it pan out through the whole year? It's really sort of interrogating the robustness of those figures. Okay, is that going to be Dave going to answer that one? Dave Anderson? Uh, Dave, Dave's not on the, uh, on the call. Uh, oh, not. Sorry, yeah. no um, I'll kick off with, with it. I don't know whether Howard actually wants to come in knowing uh, his involvement in, in, in the work as well. Um, the occupancy that uh, uh, figures uh, 57% is what is included in the, in the papers, which shows that there is some spare capacity, significant spare, spare capacity across 
the car parks in the in the city centre. Um, I think it's uh, it's worth then sort of also noting, which I think he does in, in the paper, that there are potentially with the loss of uh, the uh, Warina uh, to the university and, and Pleasure Fair, uh, there could be a, a pinch point around the south of the city centre. But there are opportunities then to increase uh, capacity by decking some surface level car parks if we if we want to. What we've got at the moment is, 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 is evidence that we didn't have before, which I think is very timely and very important. What we now need to do is take decisions on what we do with that information. And that hasn't happened yet. So uh, that's something that we still need to, to think through and, and work with the cabinet on, on what we do next with, uh, with the work. But having the strategy or having the work and the evidence gives us a really strong starting point to understand occupancy. And just to answer your other question about uh, what time of year, uh, you, you can be reassured it wasn't uh, taken a, over the last uh, 10 or 12 months. It was based on, on stats prior to, to March. So uh, that, that occupancy figure isn't based on empty car parks uh, since March. Thank you, Councillor Judy Fox. Thank you, Chair. My question is about the car parking again, and it's basically, I've not been in town for a long time, um, parking in St Peter's Road. Um, we have got a lot of disabled parking spaces and they have been moved. My question is, is um, are we going to get more behind um, the town hall, St Peter's Road? And um, are, are they going to be changed at all? Because um, obviously they're up the other end, but now St Peter's Arcade's closed. They've moved up the other further up the other end towards the car haven um what's the situation there because there are a lot of lot of people who are disabled use that that st peter's road to park the cars that the disabled people that's that's my question thank you thank you steve or howard yes yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll pick that one up but uh yes the, the disabled spaces have been moved to the other end of st peter's road because the the arcade uh, is closed to, to enable access into uh, the city centre. Um, there's no plans to, to change that. We'll keep it under review, of course, uh, and make sure it is difficult times at the moment. We don't know how many people in a steady state would want to, to come in uh, necessarily into the city centre, including uh, people wanting disabled spaces. But we will keep that under review as we, we are doing uh, with the rest of the car parking around the city centre. Um, but at the moment, there's no, no plans to change that. We, we must respond to, to what uh, is best for, for, for disabled people wanting to get into the city centre. And I think we've done that uh, and we'll keep a very close eye on that, consulting with, uh, with disability groups as we would. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor John Fox. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. I didn't realise Julie was going to ask that question. <laughs> Proves we don't always talk. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, she's quite right. And also, as you know, the national average for disability parking should, or spaces should be roughly 6%. Uh, what percentage are we up to? And are we going to improve on that in your car parking strategy? Because it is important to get more people into the city centre, especially the disabled people, because sometimes even the local transport is not suitable uh, in some cases. Uh, we need to get facilities for them and the wide ones, the extra wide facilities for larger vehicles, i.e. transit vans with the, the, you know, the hoists off the back. Because at the moment, if they park in St Peter's up, you know, road, they have to go into the road with a person in a wheelchair or whatever, and which is not really suitable. So it really is a strategy. I'm pleased to hear you're going to liaise with disability groups because it's very, very important. Steve, do you want to add anything back on that? Uh, uh, nothing specific, helpful. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Um, I will though look at the 6% figure. I just want to, with colleagues, just make sure that we are at that figure. I'm sure we are, but uh, I will just, just check that. I don't, I, sorry, but in, I don't think you will be, Steve. I think you'll, be, you'll find that you'll be a lot lower than that. And that's what concerns me. So okay. if, you, if you could possibly, I know you're very, very busy, come back to me with a figure. I'd be very interested, and so would some of the disability groups, because if the national average is 6%, we should be nearer to that than anything else. Or, in fact, I'd like to see it above that personally, but there you go. Good. Uh, ch Chairman, do you mind if I just um, say something just quickly? Yes, David. Um, that, um, Councillor Fox, that 6% figure, could I just clarify exactly what that was referring to for the minutes, please? I think you'll find it is for off-on-road parking for disabled disabled parking facilities. I know you've got Queensgate, but this is on road parking. Uh, because as you know, uh, St Peter's Arcade, sorry, not the Arcade, 
St Peter's Road gives you near enough access to the city centre, to the cathedral, to the main shopping centre, even to Queensgate. I know Queensgate does, but, you know, we need more. Is that okay, David? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Wigan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, my uh, concern is about the pinch points <coughs> at the um, flat and keys end uh, of the city, um, particularly when the uh, the new the hotel and government hub are built, uh, and with the car parking being taken away, are we confident there's going to be enough um, car parking in that area for those sites and the other sites on? Um, uh, flat and keys that haven't been built yet, including provision of uh, disabled spaces for both staff in those buildings where it's not being provided and uh, for customers to those buildings. And are they likely to travel to other car parks rather than parking in and around the area? Um, I know there's a big problem with parking on Hawksbill Way, which is the um, the new estate that goes down the side of the football ground, even with yellow uh, lines there. Um, so it's a big concern that there won't be enough parking in that area. Steve, back to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Wigan. I, I think it is it's something that we will need to make sure is is sufficient. And there are there are ways of increasing uh, car parking capacity on some of the surface car parks that are in the in the area, uh, potentially north of the the river as well. Um, so the part of the, 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 the response that we will make to the, the evidence that we've got will take account of exactly the points that you're raising. And I think it's helpful for you to, to flag them uh, when we go and ask uh, Cabinet to consider the, uh, the next steps. Uh, those are exactly the points I think they would want to, to be considering themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, just to remind everybody, we've, we've nearly run out of time in the section, but because it's so important, there's so many big um, subjects, I'm going to carry on for a while yet, but please keep your questions as short as possible so we can get as many uh, answers in as possible. And again, with the answers, please, officers, as short as possible. So we're going to move on now to, uh, on page 17, to North Westgate. Councillor Aitken. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I will keep my my questions quick. I have three, but hopefully there'll be quick answers as well. Um, so with regards to North West Gate, um, in the paragraph that we have in the report, it says, if Hawksworth are unable to progress their scheme, then after a period of time, a put an old option will apply. Can you um, first of all tell me what period of time that will allude to? Is that weeks? Is that months? Is that years? Um, and what's a put and all option, please, first of all? Okay, Steve. Thank you. Um, the, the period of time, I, I, the collaboration agreement is the, the uh, mechanism that we've got in place with Hawksworth to, uh, um, uh, to shape the, the joint working we have. Um, the period of time, I think, is one that we would agree between us. Um, I don't think there's a specified length and I think that's probably right because it's difficult to be um, clear on uh, the timelines for acquisitions especially if we get into a CPO situation which we want to avoid on, on, on the buildings and land in the area um, and the put and call is, is, is then if essentially if, um, if, if the outcome that we're expecting uh, is, not, uh, is not achieved then we agree between us that there is an alternative way of delivering the ambition that we've got for the, for the scheme. Uh, we perhaps shouldn't include the, the technical information and language in the report. We should make it clear uh, what it says. So, so th thank you for that. But it gives us a mechanism essentially for, for helping us to decide that we're going to do something different uh, if, it's not, if it's not progressed in the way that we envisaged. Okay, thank you for that. Um, my second question is, uh, with regards to the relocation of the churches, um, I take it there are two churches that, and it, it refers to um, a consultation with the congregations. Um, again, um, there's no sort of time or dates with regards to those consultations. So can you just elaborate on, on what you're hoping to achieve there? Yes, uh, consultation is going to be really important as part of that. It's something that Hawksworth are, are taking forward and we've made it clear that what our expectations are on that. Um, 
I can I can ask around timelines for that and and to make sure that uh, the committee is aware of what those uh, arrangements are for for consultation so that you're fully fully aware of that. But I'll I'll take that one away if I may. Council. Look, no, no problem at all. I don't um yeah just if, if we could all be made aware of when that consultation takes place that information would be useful and my final question is just a quick one with regards to the brewery tap am i right in thinking that that will be staying now as part of that that whole area yes i, th I think that's a, again a further further discussion to to be had um i think there is uh uh i think a, a discussion with 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 hawksworth as the as the developer uh, to see what the overall mix that we want to see in in that part of of the uh, of the city, uh, the relationship of that to to the surrounding area is going to be important. Uh, but that that's a conversation that we'll need to have, uh, not just ourselves, but we need to have it with Hawksworth and, and something again we can come back with details on once we've got a little bit further down down the line. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Um, Parish Council Keith Bluesley. A uh, question for Steve, Chair. Steve, on the report, it took on the station quarter I'm referring to. Oh, hang on, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> oh, sorry, Chair. Yep, you jumped the gun a bit. I'll come back to you, um, Keith. Don't worry. Uh, anything else on North Westgate? Then I'm going to go to North Minster. Councillor Burbage, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my mind's regarding the development in uh, Northminster, um, particularly in relation to the market. Um, obviously, it, it's, it's obvious that market traders have been dealt a pretty rough hand in recent months, not only with COVID, but the um, recent demolition of the multi-storey car park. Um, the statement says, uh, the, the report says, one option under exploration in, is the retention of the market at ground floor level. So my first question would be, would that uh, still be in the same situation with the same facilities? It then goes on to say, however, if this proves not to be feasible or viable, the council will be required to relocate the market before the development of the area can progress. So my second question would be, um, if we could have a little bit more information on that and have any other sites been identified or explored yet, please? You're going to be busy tonight, Steve. Steve, it's yours. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off. I don't know whether anything more widely on Northminster uh, is uh, whether Howard wants to come in on, on that. But on, in terms of the market, uh, it, it is, as it says in the, in the report, um, we haven't taken decisions on the market as yet. Um, there is a, a working group that's being established to look at options. Uh, so, so, and that will want to take views uh, of market traders and others about whether that is the right part of the city centre to retain a market. If so, what form should it take? What are the alternative options that we may want to consider elsewhere? And actually what type of market uh, does, does the city want? And those are questions I think that we do need to address and answer uh, before decisions can be taken. Uh, and that will need to be done in a timely way uh, because the Northminster scheme uh, that Howard may want to just give a bit more detail on uh, is obviously got needing to move forward now. So those two things will synchronise with each other, but the work is beginning on, on options for the market and uh, that will progress over the coming months. Howard, would you like to add to that? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to really touch on one of the questions around uh, how Northminster as a scheme is going to be developed and come forward. Uh, <laughs> Pip is taking the... Uh, the same approach it took with regards to flattened keys, uh, which is about deliverability first and foremost. So it's first and foremost looking at developing a scheme that can actually be delivered uh, for the benefit of the area and for the wider city. That's the work that's underway at the moment, and that necessarily means we're examining the options for how the different components of a potential scheme will come forward. As David said in his comments in, uh, in the report, uh, one of those components may be a market. Um, none of those are fixed at the moment. We don't have a fixed scheme. We're just examining how the scheme will look to ensure that the site can actually be fought forward to be delivered uh, for the benefit of the area. And that will be the work we do over the coming months. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else on Northminster? No, and we'll go to Station Quarter and Paris Councillor Keith Leasley. You can start. Sorry for, sorry for jumping the gun, Chairman. All right, no problem. 
I'd like to ask Steve about the uh, mention in the report of a new multi-storey car park to the east of the station. I'm slightly confused, Steve, because the, the hotel is east of the station. So is this on the site between Bush Boulevard and the hotel? Or is it between Crescent Bridge and the police station and west of the current multi-storey car park? Uh, that was first question. And the implications of that, um, having inserted the uh, signalled uh, southbound access to the south car park, which overcomes some of the very complicated access arrangements, uh, if you then insert something north of Crescent Roundabout, it's not as easy to do that with two-way flow. So I just wondered, A, where is it going to be and how are you going to deal with the sort of comp uh, exacerbating the traffic flow problem north, north of Crescent Bridge? Good. Steve? Th thank, thank you. Yeah, the, um, it's the first question. It will be between the, uh, the, the station and, and Crescent Bridge. Uh, so technically not as purely east, perhaps, as it's described in the in the report. So, so thank you for, for the question. Um, and the important part about that is that it then connects to the station frontage being uh, underneath uh, Crescent Bridge uh, or around Crescent Bridge to enable that connection from the station into the city centre to be a, a much easier and more and a friendlier one than it is at the moment. Um, and, and I think that's an important part of the public realm improvements uh, that will see uh, less traffic and more priority for, for pedestrians and cyclists to connect into the city centre from a new front door, if you like, to, to the station. Um, so so the, the more work to be done on the signals and signalisation and all traffic movement around Crescent, Crescent Bridge and the roundabout in, in the further work uh, that will be done. But at the moment, we've got an outline master plan that is showing the ambition and the first phase, which is the first phase that we've described in the, in the report. So there's more work done on the sort of detail I think that you're rightly asking about. So, sorry, Steve, are you saying that the uh, you'll still come out onto Bourges Boulevard where he comes out now? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult to explain it without putting a, a map and maybe we can, we can provide a bit more detail uh, in, in, uh, in time when we've got some, some more certain plans at the moment. But the, the principles around it are to reduce traffic around Crescent Bridge, improve pedestrian access from the station to the city centre, uh, partly by having... Uh, the, the entrance to the station closer to the city centre by Crescent Bridge. It would be far easier if I could talk that through with, with some, some maps and diagrams and, and maybe, Chair, we can, we can pick that up and think of a way of doing that as the scheme progresses. Yeah, that's fine. That's Thanks, good. Steve. Uh, Councillor John Fox. Yeah, a very quick one. Uh, as Councillor Hill will know, we took a group of people with various disabilities to the station quarter uh, that area and looked at how they cross from the station to uh, Queensgate. Now, in your your discussions on that in your working group, are you discussing making the facilities or or the area more user friendly with people on mobility scooters in wheelchairs and that sort of thing? Because it is really really important. Because you might think it's safe, they don't. Um, I've got Steve. I don't know if you can answer. Councillor Hill, I'm not sure if you've come in as well, Councillor, which one? Um, yeah, yes, if I might. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what Steve wants to, to contribute, but um, certainly disability access is very, very important. You're absolutely right, Councillor Fox. Um, we did this exercise, I mean, it must have been a couple of years ago now, um, but the station as is, is very uh, disability unfriendly. Um, with the pedestrian bridge across the bourge as well, which which just 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 doesn't work. Um, we we are aware of that, and I'm sure, um, in, in, in as much as I can be sure, um, that disability access from the station into the city will will be certainly very high on the list of priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on then to Towns Fund. Councillor Leesley, put your hand up. Or not, no. no. Okay, then we're on uh, page 18 and we're on to Middleham. Nothing on there. Pleasure Fair Meadow. I mean, I know we've done quite a bit on the pool there, so I don't want to revisit that unless there's anything particular in there that wasn't on the last one. Okay, the Cafe Culture. No. Okay, then we'll move on 
to the bottom of that, which is the which is PIRI, which is the Infrastructure and Regeneration Peterborough Integrated Renewables Infrastructure, or PIRI. No. Could I just confirm from that that um, the heat part we're talking about is from the incinerator? Is that where we're, we're talking about getting this heat from? Oh. Yes, that's that's part of the uh, the uh, the project. Uh, it's uh, yes, it is. Uh, can, uh, Jeff. Just just to clarify, because it wasn't in there, I just want to make sure that we weren't looking at a different heat source. That's fine. Thank you, Councillor Hiller. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if I might, Chair, there's probably more uh, Councillor Ceresti's portfolio than yes. my particular portfolio, but it, it's um, it, it's a, a very ambitious plan, um, which is a, a two year. Plan, if you if you will, for, for the feasibility of this, and um, it it really is very exciting, I have to say, and and very forward looking. Um, but as I say, it is probably more the environment portfolio than, than mine. But it has been included in the report. I, I get I get that. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Right. If there's no further questions, which no more hands up, I would like to note the recommendation in the report, which is for committee to note the contents of the report. Um, are the committee satisfied we have done this? Um, if you're not satisfied, please raise your hand. Now I've got a hand up from Councillor Zinn. Do you have a recommendation or are you objecting? Sorry. I oh, know um, it was a question actually. Sorry. All right. Okay. What, what, where, where were we on? Because we've gone out. Page were... 19. Hang on. Hang on. Let me go back. It's under the financial implications section. Yes, yes, okay, yep, yeah, page 19, yep. Yeah. So my question is, um, I know the report um, states that there's no direct financial implications arising from the report. Um, so my question is, um, have you identified any potential implications upon the implementation of um, what we've covered in the report? Steve, would that be you? Yeah, I, I think, uh, thank you. I think, I think the implications section there is, is commenting on any decisions that are being taken tonight or recommendations that are being put forward. There, there are none being put forward, so therefore there aren't any financial implications directly arising from it. But if there are implications from individual projects, then when decisions are taken, the financial implications will be set out on a project by project. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Councillor Hiller. Did you want to add something as well? Um, only in as much as that's exactly what I, I get from from the uh, from the report, and uh, I completely agree with uh, with Steve Cox. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I've done the bit about objections. We haven't got any of those. Um, Recommendation-wise, I've still got here. I think committee will agree um, that we wanted some information at some point on when the North Westgate consultation begins, with some uh, dates and who will be consulted and probably some more detail on the station quarter plans. Is that okay? Yeah, anybody else? Councillor Wiggin? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. It was uh, more information on um, the state of road adoptions, um, what progress has been made. Yes, okay, that, that will be for, um, yeah, that's for highways. So you're happy with that? Yes. Thank you. David, are you all right with that? Uh, yeah, so I've got this recorded as um, actions rather than recommendations, but yeah, I'll make sure that this briefing notes get sent out. That's right. Good, thank you. So I won't go for a, uh, a second or anything because there are only reports. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody, um, for all the officers for your um, for your time and your your, your excellent answers. Uh, obviously, if you don't need to be in the next section, then please um, do leave the uh, meeting and have a good night to you and stay safe, of course. Okay, we're going to go to agenda item uh, six which is the Culture and Leisure Services in Peterborough, pages 75 to 80 uh, of the agenda. Um, I'd like to welcome again, Councillor Steve Allen, and also Adrian Chapman, Services Director, Communities and Partnerships, to present this report. Councillor Allen or Adrian, would, would you like to present your report? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good evening, uh, Chair and uh, members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, bring this report to the committee. Um, you'll see that the report covers a number of specific uh, elements of the culture leisure um, um, portfolio but interestingly also asks um, that you suggest any additional themes to explore um, 
economic growth. Uh, so I'm sure that perhaps any ideas will be welcome during the uh, question period that we'll go through. Uh, it, it is a fact that uh, it's been challenging times to run a culture and recreation portfolio at a time when any, everything is locked down. And because culture and recre recreation is of course all about bringing people together for shared experiences. Um, and it's a fact that uh, vibrant uh, culture and leisure sector increases the availability of jobs and keeps our population healthy, both uh, engaged mentally and physically. Uh, because of those challenges, it's an interesting report that I do hope that you will embrace and uh, accept the recommendations. Uh, and what I would also bring to your attention is that uh, 4.5 mentions the uh, culture strategy uh, being um, uh, work has commenced. Well, the work has now completed. The initial report is with me. Uh, and it's uh, an exciting uh, project to take forward. It's the time for a strategic rethink um, because I think that uh, the key theme is that we must empower our all communities and cultural interest in the city. And I think that will be the backbone of uh, the portfolio going forward. So I I'm happy to take questions and have Adrian here to support me with any questions on specific items of the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to do the same thing, uh, members, with your uh, uh, permission and, and go by page. So unless there's something particular on 75, I'm going to move to 76, all the items there. No. So when we get to 77, we'll go by topic. So we'll go Flag Fen. Anything on Flag Fen? Councillor Casey? No, not Councillor Casey. No, thank you, thank you, Chair. It was <laughs> actually it, there was just something I wanted to say on page seventy six, which was, and I know at full council I was asking about whether or not we'd applied for the grants from the Arts Council, and and I can remember Adrian saying that uh, that we were, and that he was he was quite happy for us. And I was just going to say, excellent. It's great news to hear that we that we got that grant for the key, and I very I very much. Uh, very much needed really in these in these times um i'd i'd, I'd also i got a question about the flag fen okay um because it, it talks about the the goal the necklace um and and the various other projects that we're linking with there was one that uh that's in huntingdonshire which is also actually i think i've already said it great fen as opposed to flag fen um the, the great fen which is done by i think it's run by huntingdonshire district council and they've they've got this project and i think councillor brown knows about it too where they where they're recreating the the landscape and the environment of 3500 years ago which ties in quite nicely with the timeline for the for the boats and i was just wondering whether or not we'd had any discussions with them about having a a four beaded necklace. <laughs> I like that idea, Councillor Casey, and I am now on that committee rather than Councillor Brown. So yeah, yeah. I know more yeah, about yeah. looking after invertebrates than I ever thought I would. Um, <laughs> the uh, re-wetting of the wetlands is an interesting concept and something that uh, it's taken me some time to get a real understanding of, but I like the idea of linking it with what we are doing. And uh, I have indeed mentioned that uh, to that board when being at meetings. Okay, lovely. Um, Adrian, do you want to add anything to? No, um, not at all. I, I, um, thanks, uh, <coughs> Councillor Casey, for the uh, comments about the fund. There is uh, now a second round of Arts Council recovery funding launched, and we uh, met with Councillor Allen yesterday and are considering some options for that uh, fund also, given the second or third lockdown, depending on which way you describe it, um, and the kind of setback we've had in reopening services so uh, we'll definitely be pitching for for more money and uh, on the string of pearls uh, project um, the Whittlesea end of that string of pearls so in Fenland have secured funding now for uh, the King's Dyke project which is really exciting. Okay Councillor Lee, have you got something on flag then? Actually, Chair, I was just going to say I like the idea from the cultural strategy of, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around between the two, but I, I missed my key. Um, I love the idea of, of supporting the, the artists locally, because I, I must also giving credit to Kate Hall, who's been running the, the culture uh, web, webinars uh, right through lockdown. And that's been a really good way of keeping all the uh, cultural practitioners together and actually keeping their motivation going and giving them ideas and actually that's that's been a real success 
Good. Thank you. Um, so on flag then, Councillor Leesley. No. Sorry, it was on. I wanted to ask a question on the museum, Chairman. We'll Can I do that? that? We're going to that next. So, as there's no other questions, museum and art gallery. Yes, Councillor Leesley. Uh, I'd say to Stephen uh, Adrian, I think the, the museum's always been slightly underwhelming, but the proposal to have the extension with the Must Farm boats is a real game changer. Uh, and it's under the town fund. I just wondered if Steve and Adrian could say what the timeline is before we actually see this uh, in fruition. I think I'll leave that with Adrian if it's time scale. The sooner the yeah. better is my response. And um, uh, yeah, Councillor Allen and I share the same view. And, and, and thank you, um, Councillor um, Leavesley. I think I absolutely agree with you. This has uh, is a significant game changer. Um, you know, I think the must farm boats are of international significance. And I just say, actually, on the, on the, for anybody that's passionate about Peterborough, listening to the previous item and then talking about um, a really refreshed and renewed culture and leisure offer to support uh, the growth agenda is just uh, phenomenal, actually. And the museum is going to be a big part of that. Um, so it can't happen soon enough, um, enough waffle. Um, the process isn't speedy. Uh, we have about a year or so uh, deadline to submit the uh, full business case to MHCLG, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, uh, and then uh, planning and so on will follow. So I guess realistically three to five years, um, but we won't shy away from talking about this widely. I think what we're hoping through the, the museum extension, the creation of the Vine, which is the uh, uh, conversion of the TK Max building, various other key projects um, that we start to bring some hope and optimism back to the city at a time when uh, people are very tired and uh, worn down by the pandemic. So we are going to talk about this quite widely. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Key Theatre. Councillor Howard. I nearly fell over pressing my uh, hand there. <laughs> uh, just to say, firstly, thank you for a really, a really interesting report, and I think uh, you know a massive, the massive theme of build back better is is all through this report. Really exciting to read. Um, I just wanted to note, I, I was really pleased to see with the key, key theatre that there's a collaborative effort to work with the Crescent and the new theatre, so that there isn't a clash in bookings or styles. And I think that'd be really good for the future because I think if we look to a day when this is all over and we can all go out and um, socialise again and enjoy ourselves it would be wonderful to have all three assets you know remain successful in the city and I think working together you know to make sure the bookings don't clash or you know are too similar is a really good move so yeah whoever come up with that fantastic keep up the good work. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you and now to libraries. And then we've got the new regional pool again. Anything extra on that anybody wants to talk about? No. Then we're going to move to page 78. So we're going to start with the Warrington Sports Centre and Library. Councillor John Fox. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, the residents of Warrington, myself and Julie and Steve, are very excited about this. But I've, the last... Um, Sentence, the development will go ahead as soon as suitable funding has been identified. Could Adrian explain that to us a bit more? Because we were under the impression there weren't a problem. But uh, just reassure me, please. <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, absolutely, Councillor Fox. Uh, sorry, Chair, if I may um, just respond to that. Um, so um, don't, don't be alarmed by that phraseology. Um, there is uh, funding clearly just, just for the committee's benefit. We're, we're just in the process of commissioning the study that will be required to uh, create the appropriate model. Um, I'm hoping that uh, by the end of this month, we'll have, had, we'll have commissioned the um, uh, consultancy that will carry out that work. Um, that um, is backed by um, a lot of evidence that shows a shortage of uh, leisure provision uh, in the city, particularly in the north of the city. And, and I'm sure um, our parish council colleagues will be um, keen to see something that side of, uh, of the city centre as well, and particularly those rural areas in the north and the west. So it's really vital and there is absolute support for this. Um, 
we um, don't anticipate uh, any issues at all with uh, uh, securing funding, either uh, capital funding or and or uh, match funding from third parties, given the amount of interest there is from Sport England and other key partners. Uh, so, yeah, please don't be alarmed. Uh, it's a uh, green light. Thank you. I'll sleep better tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll move on then to Football Foundation Local Football Facility Plans. Coming upon that one now. Anything else at all? And any other items on that page 78? Councillor Zinn. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on um, financial implications. Um, so my question is, um, I know that the form, formal transfer assets is ongoing and then we're in the process of closing off leisure transactions. Um, how is that going? When when will it be completed by? So we are as um, we are as close as anything. I, I, we may even have crossed the line since the report was written um, in terms of that process. Although um, services transferred from the first of October, the actual financial close down of um, Vivacity's contract with the council um, t has taken a lot longer, as you'd expect. Um, and there's been an awful lot of unpicking to be done. Um, the anticipated um, conclusion of that work was December. Um, it, I think it ran into the new year, but uh, if it hasn't already been concluded, it, it, it's not far from being concluded. No, absolutely no uh, surprises, nothing uh, at all that came up in the uh, due, due diligence work that we weren't already aware of. Um, uh, you know, and overall, I think um, it's been an, an extremely smooth process and probably worth paying tribute again to Vivacity, who found themselves in a really difficult position, obviously, with the pandemic causing um, them to have to hand the contract back. But they've left us uh, with an, a really strong legacy uh, and uh, a, and actually a financial position, which, uh, you know, we, we have concluded now is is in. Um, good order, no surprises, and you know there's everything to play for. I think for the city. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I've seen no more hands up. Okay, so um, I'd like us to note the recommendation, the report, which is for us as a committee to note the contents of the report. Um, are the committee satisfied that we have done this? If not, can you please raise your hand? Councillor Leavesley. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. Can I ask a question on page 79, please? 79. Hang on a minute. Really? Yeah, of course. Carry on. Just which way? Yeah, carry on. Um, I'd like to ask Stephen Adrian. There's a reference there under rural implications to the Warrington Centre providing, as Adrian's just said, for the rural population in the north and west. Um, I've made a point before that one of the um, uh, active activities, uh, sporting activities, leisure activities in this area is cycling. And in 2020, we were encouraged uh, under the uh, umbrella of the John Clare countryside strategy to try and work with Forest England on Southie Woods and to improve the cycling access to Southie Wood and our area coming up from the Neen Valley, etc. cetera. Um, finance, we were promised, but that seems to have gone very quiet. I just wondered if Adrian and Steve, if it's under their remit, uh, apologies if it's not, if they can say what's happening to the initiative sort of post-COVID reinforcing what people have been doing in lockdown to improve cycling access to the northwest part of uh, the city. So uh, I don't know if um, Steve may know more. Um, it doesn't specifically necessarily sit with me, but that's that's not um, a, 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 an excuse not to provide some form of response, however. And and, and if, if we can't respond specifically to that exact question, uh, Keith, we'll take that away and, and provide you with an update. But what I would say is that what the pandemic has done is thrown up uh, this issue of uh, behaviour change and the really vital importance of outdoor leisure being um, the way of the future As, alongside you know more formal indoor leisure provision it doesn't in any way dilute from the fact that we do need more indoor leisure provision such as that that we are um, developing out at Warrington but the um, you know I think today compared to even a year ago um, the resonance of um, building up for example good cycle infrastructure uh, developing cycle schemes walking schemes making the a best use of our amazing countryside we're surrounded by some incredible um 
open spaces, beautiful villages, you know, places that are real destinations in their own right. And if that can support the health and well-being agenda and the recovery from the last most awful 10 months, then that's exactly what we should be doing. And in fact, I'm leading a meeting tomorrow on uh, the green recovery, a sort of kickoff meeting around the green recovery agenda as part of that. So I know that doesn't quite answer the question specifically, um, and Steve may want to come in, but certainly from a, a council point of view and a culture and leisure point of view, we absolutely recognise that we need to do much more in that kind of use of our open space. Yeah, Adrian's, you know, sorry. Um, Adrian's overview is, is excellent uh, and mine will be broadly based as well as a councillor for a, a rural ward. Um, I also understand uh, what you're saying, uh, uh, Parish Councillor Keith. Um, we do need to make sure that we don't neglect the rural communities uh, and certainly Councillor Fox had a motion at full council encouraging additional cycling facilities to the east of uh, the city, which I support. And what we have to do is make sure that the green wheel is improved uh, and maintained better and extended if possible. Those kind of things must be part of our uh, future with improving walking and cycling and connecting our townships and our villages to the city. I I'm a big supporter of that, but I can't give you a specific answer to your question, but I do hope that uh, the enthusiasm and positivity that Adrian has uh, uh, come forward with and my own will reassure you in some ways. No, I, I can assure you that, uh, I mean, I look out of my kitchen window at Southie Wood and I can just go down the road and walk up into it. And it's been a sort of lifesaver in the last sort of six to eight months, really. Um, and increasingly, uh, people coming out from Peterborough where they don't have large gardens or, or access to footpaths. It's been very well used uh, and, you know, giving, giving greater access is something we should want to achieve, Steve. Yeah. So thank you for your support anyway. Steve Cox, you've got something to add? Yeah, thank you. It's really just to carry that, uh, that enthusiasm and commitment through. Um, the, Steve's mentioned the Green Wheel. Uh, we're investing in, in that and, and can do more, I'm sure. The active travel measures, uh, there's a second tranche of, uh, of schemes that the cross-party group will be considering. I think it's tomorrow, uh, which again will capture that momentum that uh, Adrian was talking about. And yeah, I think it's one of the, uh, one of the positives over the last uh, 10 months or so is that people have been out on their bikes and walking. And, and we need to do whatever we can to help them to continue to want to do that. Councillor Fox, John Fox. And very quickly, you're not the only one, Keith. Uh, Peacock Parish Council have got a scheme they'd like to operate from Peacock to Market Deepin. I'd like to see us be able to bike all the way from I all the way to, to Stamford. It'll be fantastic on a safe route. Rossborough, if you look at their figures, it's a high percentage of fatalities with cyclists are in the rural. It's nearly double. So we need to make cycling safety safer. So yeah, any support any of us can give, we should. Obviously, it's down to finance, but then we need to hammer home at the you know the, the government. Good. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Okay, there's no more hands up now. I trust. Let's give it a second. Right. So I said earlier, we're being asked to note the report. If anybody, I think we have. If anybody thinks we haven't, would you like to raise your hand now? No, okay. Uh, then again, can I please uh, thank the officers? Uh, excellent, again, excellent answers. Thank you very much for your report. Um, and thank you members for your questions. Obviously those officers um, who are no longer needed can obviously leave now and have a good night. And again, keep yourself well, okay? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, committee. Okay, then we're gonna move on now to item seven, which is your page 81 to 86 in your packs, which is monitoring scrutiny recommendations. David, I'd hand this over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a standing item on the agenda, as you know, um, that allows members to consider the responses from cabinet members and officers to recommendations made by the committee at previous meetings and uh, determine if any further monitoring is required on those items. Thank you. Okay. Anybody got any comments to make on that? Or are we happy to remove them? Have they been answered? I'm getting lots of nodding heads, which is quite good. Yep, yeah, okay, so we're going to take remove those, if you would, please, David. We're, we're happy with the answers. Okay, um, just to clarify, Chair, um, would members like to keep the HRA recommendation live? Because that hasn't yet. Yeah, that's not finished yet, so we'll keep, we'll keep that one. Just the one at the top? Yes. Okay, thank you. Anybody got anything different? To it? Right. Okay, then we'll move on from that one then to agenda item number eight. 
which is uh, 87134, which is your forward plan of executive decisions. Uh, again, David. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this gives members um, the usual opportunity to review any items on the forward plan relevant to this committee and request further information um, if, you, um, if you require it. And just to say that the version that's published in the agenda is still the up-to-date version. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Skips then. then. Uh, yeah, page 98, um, approval of funding for provision of accommodation to reduce homelessness. I'd like to hear more about what that is, how much that is, and how that's being used. Uh, maybe a briefing note, or how does that normally work? David, I think that would be all right, wouldn't it? If we had a briefing note, then, then we can decide if we want to drill down any further or whether that's... Well, I was a bit surprised to see it was under our... our um, I thought it was in adults and communities, the homelessness, but it seems to be under us here in this... I mean, I think it covers both committees, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's slightly ambiguous because it's slightly spills over into councillor, um, sorry, into Pete Carpenter's finance portfolio. But yes, I'll, I'll request a briefing note and, and get that sent around to the whole committee, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skipstead for that. And Councillor Ellis, got one. Okay, yeah, page 95, vehicle removal for parking contravention. Just want to be more um, information, perhaps a brief note. It says about um, a appointing a local authority trading company. So is this a, would this be a separate separate from the, um, the enforcement section as it is at the moment. So would it be um, parking enforcement um, separate to the other, the others? And also a little bit more, so a brief note about what it covers as well. I presume it covers areas where, you know, lines, there's double yellow lines and stuff like that. So I, I'm not sure if it would cover when the cars park on green areas. Um, and there's, I suppose, a signage saying that they shouldn't. So just a bit more, maybe a briefing note to elaborate on it. Yeah, we'll go with that first, and then we can we can ask for more if necessary, can't we? That's, that's fine. Are you okay with that, David? I've given made a note of that. Thanks, Chair. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Right to agenda item nine then. The one three five to one four two. This is your work program for twenty. 21 really we've not got 20 anymore uh david uh, thank you chair um it's just um giving members the opportunity to make any amendments for the future work program although this would of course be um discussed at group reps as well and i think uh councillor skip said has uh, has a hand up you does yeah i haven't had a chance to talk to my group yet rep about this but i did um would like the closure of saint peter's arcade to be an agenda item um looking at the minutes from last time it mentioned that the cabinet minister was of the opinion that it would would probably be closed and i'd like to know more about that because i believe that's not something that would be just done without going through a consultation or a, or a planning um application so could that be on the agenda for the next one is that possible for march i know it's i know it's there's a lot still to, to be put on the agenda but um, what I'll do, if it's okay with chair and members, is just um, speak to officers and um, see who the relevant person would be for that, invite them to the group reps meeting, and then you can discuss the, the feasibility of it um, with them then. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible, is, David, is it possible to have any input from any disability groups? Because I know that it's, there's a big issue around the disability parking. I don't know how many disability groups were consulted about this, but is there, is there any chance of that being part of it? Is it part of the scrutiny report that may come in March. yeah um well that would be something you could talk to the officer about when setting the agenda and okay. give that steer thank you yeah, make notes of that because we'll know to know who's consulted won't we and and uh, what they what they were saying about it so how they yeah. make the decision for or against obviously they don't know what that is so. thank you super that's a good one thank you councillor fox yeah i share those concerns and i believe it's out the consultation at the moment but i hope they consult all councillors which i'm sure they will because I have a strong view on it as well. Um, I won't go into it now, because it's the wrong wrong time. But but if you could re reassure us of that, I'd be very happy. Yeah, I think we need to do it. We need to make sure that in in um, whatever we get, we know who's consulted and when and what they said. You know. Well, we need to know that we've had a voice in it. Not you know what I mean. I'm not being negative, but we need to be able to have a, a platform to voice our opinions. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's good. Anything else? Councillor, oh, hang on a minute. Uh, Councillor Ellis, I've got your hand again, have I? Or, or, yes? So it's jumping about on my screen a bit, so. 
So just literally, oh, sorry, my, my, my hand's going to be funny now. Literally on that point, um, yeah, I think it's important that we perhaps program it in, especially look at the decision because um, Spears Arcade being closed for the reasons because of COVID, because of space. If now you have to actually go around the building and the actual walkway around the side is actually narrower than what St. Peter's Arcade is. Um, so it, it's, you know, we, and, and I think it is a, a clear connection. Um, so we do need to look carefully at this, take it on board what's, you know, the previous, speak, you know, previous people have said. Yeah. Councillor yeah, so Casey. Thank you, Chair. I was really just thinking, because I can remember when we closed the, um, the walkway by the Barclays, it came to planning committee. And I suppose one of the things we've got to be careful of as members or those who are members of the planning committee is that so, uh, if it does come to us, we we can't really be giving an opinion before it, before it comes before us in that forum. Quite right. Quite right. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Hopefully anybody who's on the planning committee, me included, of course, now won't, um, won't um, show our cards if necessary. Having said that, you can. The end of the day, as long as you declare it and, and you come away from it. So um, I wouldn't say that you can't if, if you feel strong enough, you should. OK, good. Anything else? No. Right. OK, so we've finished that item. And the last item is the dates of next meetings. Now, they're not quite right because that's not quite been decided yet, as you probably know by your emails, uh, the joint scrutiny of the budget. Um, there are provincial dates that have been sent around for people to agree to, I believe. Um, so we'll wait and see what that is. But um, obviously the 10th of March one for our own meeting is still on as far as I know. So from that point of view, thank you very much, everybody, for this evening. Some, uh, it was good, some good reports and some really good questions. And um, I think the officers did really well, too, to answer them. And, um, and they knew their stuff, which is great. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, obviously, to the rest of the officers and to the Democratic Services team in the background. Um, like, like swans <laughs> with their feet going under the water. Um, please keep yourself safe. It's, it's, it's a really worrying time. I know, terrible. Um, and uh, keep well, yeah? 